I don't know Bruce Jenner. And I don't have any desire to mock him. And I don't have any desire to make jokes at his expense. But when I was kind of confronted with kind of the bombarding of media this past week that talked about his transition and the cover story that was on Vanity Fair, um, notwithstanding that I asked myself a lot of questions like why is that the most important story in America, but I just felt like I had this overwhelming sense of compassion for him. We actually discussed it at my dinner table, my boys, and uh, when they told me about everything and the cover of Vanity Fair, and they're, they're kind of who let me in on this, and so uh, we talked about it just a little bit, and, and I, I had a sense of compassion. And I think part of the compassion came because of his confusion. In, in what he said, some of it was informed by the story when he was interviewed by Diane Sawyer, I guess it was on 2020. Um, I didn't see the whole interview. But there was a piece of it that I read in the transcript that caught my attention. And it was, and he said this a number of times. And uh, maybe you saw it. This is what he said. I would say I've always been very confused with my gender identity since I was this big, said Jenner, 65, tearing up. I tried to explain it because I've had all my kids sitting in that chair and I've tried to explain it this way. God's looking down, making little Bruce. And he says, okay, what are we gonna do with this one? Make him a smart kid, very determined. And then when he's just finishing, he says, let's wait a second. And God looks down and chuckles a little bit and says, hey, let's give him the soul of a female. Now, Part of my compassion came in the fact that I I feel like that he had a confused outlook on God. But also that came from a self-confessed, confused outlook on himself and his own identity. And the truth is, is that what he's wrestling with is something that everyone's wrestling with except for the context is different. Not everybody is wrestling with issues related to gender confusion. In fact, most people aren't. But what I see and what I heard was a reminder of what is true of everyone, and that is that for everyone, we are all alienated from who we were designed to be. Every single one of us, born into this world and ultimately through sin, we are alienated from who we were designed to be. Some people try to find that fulfillment and that hope in doing a variety of different things, but the reminder of the gospel is that we will only actually find our true selves and our true identity and our true humanity when we find it in Christ. That's what the gospel teaches us. And so I I realize that most people don't have a gender confusion issue that's going on in terms of their identity, gender identity confusion, but there are a lot of people that have spiritual identity confusion. Lots of people. In fact, they can't quite decide what they are or who they are. Now, I don't make it a habit to go to college message boards to inform my theology, but I will say this. I came across in my research and in my study when I was kind of working through this message, I came across this college message board And it was an interesting statement. So there was a moderator on the message board and they often just ask a question and then some of the folks, either from that particular college or from any college, begin to weigh in on that question. Here was the question that the moderator asked. I wanna know, do you consider yourself a sinner or a saint? I would have to say that I'm 90% saint and 10% sinner. Why am I a saint? Because I'm nice? I try to help others when I'm able, I'm trustworthy, and I'm honest. Why am I a sinner? Because I don't go to church and I curse. And then he says, are you a sinner or a saint and why? Inquiring minds want to know. And then people started populating that, that thread with answers. Uh, I won't read them all to you because I'm pretty sure that for that 10 minutes that I spent there that I actually lost IQ points. 
<laughs> even though I was on a college message board. But let me give you some insight into, into a couple of the answers. Here's one. They said, hmm, that's a very interesting question to be asking. Many people will call themselves saints, but most of us are mainly sinners. On one hand, I do go to church, I pray, I'm nice, I get good grades, I donate my time and my possessions. So on the outside, I may look like a saint. But on another hand, I've had sex a couple times, but only with one person, and I'm engaged to that person and was before we started having sex. I cuss, and every now and then I hang out with some friends and drink a little. I never get drunk though. So, to summarize, I have protected sex, drink but don't get drunk, occasionally cuss, go to church, pray, read my Bible on occasion, get good grades, and I'm nice. Am I a sinner or a saint? I guess that isn't a question for me to answer, but a question for a higher being to answer. So that was answer one. And I looked through some others that I discarded, and then someone else said this, I'm no angel, that's for sure. I think we all do our fair share of good and bad. We aren't perfect. I can't give myself a rating because it's hard to tell what people count as good and bad acts. Most are self-explanatory, but opinions vary. I have no idea what any of that meant. <laughs> but that was kind of the responses that I was getting off of this college message board because it, it took me there because I was researching the idea of sinners and saints and they were asking a pertinent question and people were responding. and. So I guess I would address that question to us today. Are you a sinner or are you a saint? Now, I have had my share of conversations as a pastor with people, obviously. Sometimes they're interchanges after church, sometimes they're out in the community, sometimes they're by uh, other means or appointments or whatever. But I've had this said to me countless times through the course of ministry. Something like we're talking through an issue that they're walking through and they want to preface everything by saying, well, pastor, I, I just want to tell you, I'm no saint. Well, okay, thanks for that, cowboy. I appreciate you letting me in on that. I just want to let you know I'm no saint. Now, I, I typically am not overly nitpicky with what they're saying because I understand what they're trying to communicate and so I'm not trying to be overly technical and I'm just listening, right? Uh, I try not to be that guy who's always, well, technically, you know, you like that guy, right? It's the guy you avoid. Um, yeah. So I, I understand what they're saying, but it could be that when we're answering the question that way, hey, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm no saint. When we answer the question that way and when we think in those terms, that actually could be a window maybe into something else. It could give insight into something else and you might be surprised at where that actually leads you in terms of your identity and where it leads you even in how you respond and how you act, how you view yourself and how you view others. And so if there was ever a church that was a church full of people that would be the, well, pastor, I'm no saint, people. If there was ever a church, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I'm just saying the church would start with a C. <laughs> Corinth. Some of you were confused for a second, right? You were going, Chapel, C -A -C -C -H, right? You were trying to spell in your head. Corinth. If there was ever a church that would be described as a bunch of people who would be the kind of people that might be willing to say, well, well, pastor, I am no saint. I would think Corinth would fit the bill. When you start reading through Paul's letter to Corinth, what you find is you find Paul addressing things like people who are being divisive in the name of God, people who are sexually deviant in a variety of ways. In fact, name the way and it's probably true. People who are willing to be litigious and to sue people's pants off who are brothers and sisters in Christ. People who are actually out for their own self-glory in the name of Jesus because of the giftedness that they want to embrace, whether they embrace it or not. This is what you find at Corinth, and there are many others. We could just go through a laundry list, but there are many others. 
But you get the picture, right? If there was ever a church where you would kind of go, this is the kind of church that would say, hey, well, pastor, I'm no saint. This would be the place. So I'm curious as to how Pastor Paul addresses them when he opens the letter. And here's what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse number 1. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those, listen, sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It almost seems counterintuitive that Paul is going to address a letter about a number of issues that are happening in Corinth and the people to whom he is addressing the letter, he says that you are sanctified and you are called to be saints. Okay, that seems confusing. It's not actually, because when Paul uses that term, hagios, when he's talking about saints, it means holy ones. If you're reading the NIV translation, which which I often teach out of, that's how it translates that word. It translates them holy people or holy ones. That's a translation for what we would call saints. And so Paul actually addresses them as saints and then even goes further than that, even though these are people who are definitely doing some things that are contrary to the very heart of God. He actually, just a few verses later, talks about how secure these people are because of what Jesus has done. Listen to what he says in verse 8 and 9. He says, he will keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. He's talking to these same people and he's saying that it is God himself who is going to keep you and he is going to allow you the privilege of being kept firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is a startling thing, but what Paul is doing is he is actually using this language on purpose. He's using the language of being sanctified. That word sanctified, by the way, means being set apart. Don't think about it in terms of just meaning being set apart from something. It also means being set apart to someone. You are set apart from sin, but you are set apart to God. So that's what it means to be sanctified, that we are a called people who are set apart from sin and set apart to God, and we are now designated as saints, holy people, holy ones. This is not only who we are, but who we're called to be. So Paul talks about that who we are is who we're called to be. Therefore, be who you are. This is how he's addressing the church in Corinth from the very outset. But this language that Paul chooses is language because Paul is steeped in the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures. Remember his background. He is a Jew of Jews. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He has, in the law, in an understanding the Torah, he's brilliant. And so he knows that this is language that is actually used of God's called people before, and he's just using it again. In fact, when you read it, you can see it in the Psalms, uh, like in Psalm 16, verse number three, it says this, I say of the holy people, that translates to saints, same thing, same word. I say of the saints who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. And then in Psalm 37, it says this, For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. There's your word again for saints. Wrongdoers will be completely destroyed and the offspring of the wicked will perish. And then in Daniel chapter 7, verse number 27, it says, Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the saints, the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey him. And that's why Paul actually uses the term when he is standing before Agrippa and giving his testimony in Acts chapter 26, and he's trying to communicate what kind of man he was and what he did. Here's what he says in Acts chapter 26. I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. 
On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints, the Lord's people, in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. So in every one of these places, it's the same word usage. It's translated in the NIV, Lord's people or holy people. But it's also the same way that we would translate the word saints. And so Paul is using this term advisedly. And here's the thing. Paul is not only addressing the church in Corinth this way. But when you begin to read Ephesians, you find the exact same thing. When you begin to read Romans, you find the exact same thing. When you begin to read Philippians or Colossians or Thessalonians or his letter to Timothy, you find the exact same thing. Paul is addressing God's people as saints. Now, why is he doing that? Because what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is he is addressing those who are sanctified and those who are called to be his saints, his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that all of God's people everywhere are who we call saints. This is who they are. Now, some of you are confused because you're thinking to yourself, that can't possibly be the case because I know who saints are. They're people who've been dead a long time And they have done some miracles and people proved it. And then they get confirmed as saints. Not according to the New Testament. That's not at all what Paul says according to the New Testament. Well, saints have to be just kind of a a special grouping of people. It's like you've got Christians and then you've got saints. Right? It's like, these are the people, these are Christians, like ho-hum. And these are people who get schools named after them right? These are Christians. Okay, whatever. These are people who play football in the NFL in Louisiana. Just kidding. They named a team the Saints, right? Why didn't they name any team the Sinners? Oh, they did. The Patriots. I forgot. I couldn't remember. I thought I, I forgot. I forgot. It's a joke. It's a joke. Everyone in here thinks it's good though. You're like two Patriots fans in here. And you're like, I'm going to send him an email. You shouldn't be talking about him that way. <laughs> Stop it, sinner. <laughs> I jest, I jest. I'm having fun with you. All right. So Paul has gotten this language and he has developed it and he has called these people saints, okay? It's not just a special class of people. It is actually the whole class of those who have been transformed by Jesus Christ. He has said that you are a set apart people, set apart from sin, set apart to God. You are called saints. Why does he do this? Here's why. Not only Paul, but in the New Testament itself, listen to this, there is actually no place that I'm aware of understanding that I don't know everything about everything, but there is no place in the New Testament that I am aware of that God's collective people are collectively called sinners. No place in the New Testament that I'm aware of. That the collective people of God are collectively called sinners. Think about that for a second because it's important for your mind to be able to wrap around that because it helps to inform your understanding of identity. Now, the reason that the New Testament doesn't do that is because the New Testament understands something in the writing of it, the people that were writing it and certainly the influence of the Spirit, and it's this, that the gospel itself brings fundamental identity change. The gospel brings fundamental identity change. Now, I'm going to read you a a little bit of a lengthier passage, but I want you to grab hold of it because some of us who maybe identify ourselves as just sinners need to maybe make sure that we pay attention a little bit closer because when we are people who are transformed by the gospel, the gospel assumes that there is fundamental identity change. In fact, listen to how Paul articulates it in Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse number 1. I'm going to read a number of verses here. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. 
For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Listen to this. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. Wow. You see, this is talking about how the gospel, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, it is a radical identity, fundamental identity change that Paul is talking about. In fact, he even says it in, um, in very specific terms in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 as well. Begin with me in verse number 14. It says, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. This is Paul speaking and he's repeating some of what he said in Romans. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. And then in verse 21 it says, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is a, that's worth a clap actually. I think that was, that's worth a clap. Great. I like it. You clap for Jesus. Clap for the Bible. <laughs> You're not clapping for me. I like that. So this is a fundamental identity shift. Now, if these things are true, that the gospel brings a radical fundamental identity shift, then what is it that actually hinders us from walking in the reality of being saints? What hinders us from doing that? All right, I'm gonna try and be as practical and sensible and easy to understand as possible. Here's the first thing that I think hinders us. Our wardrobe. <laughs> Some of you are going, wow, that's really practical. Thank you. Now, if you haven't been here very long at the chapel, um, I hope you understand that uh, I'm not at all talking about trying to give you a lecture on appropriate Christian dress. That's not, that's not my, my MO. You can look around in all of the places that you find yourself in this place and in any of our campuses at Cheektowaga, at Lockport, over in the East Worship Center. Online, people are probably watching, you know, they got pajamas on probably, which is weird, don't picture it. Um, <laughs> but you can look around and, you know, we got people coming from all backgrounds who like to dress, you know, various styles and whatever and all that kind of stuff. That's not what I'm talking about at all. You'll run into people here that want to wear some suits. Great. You want to wear a suit? Cool. You want to wear a dress? Cool. You want to come in the summertime and you got shorts on and sandals? Fine. You want to wear a short sleeve shirt? Fine. You want to wear a t-shirt or a collared shirt? You want to look like a preppy golf guy or you want to look like a cool surfer dude? I don't care. I don't care. You know, really the New Testament doesn't actually give us a fundamental dress code. Uh, it, it, the, probably the extent of the dress code in the New Testament is be wise and be modest. That's kind of the extent. 
So while it's true that the people of Jesus should represent Jesus well in terms of appropriateness and, and not be immodest or seductive or any of those kinds of weird things that come along with that, those are just kind of giving in to the life of the flesh. This is not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about our wardrobe and, and what hinders us from actually walking as saints. What I'm talking about is what we, or who we, put on. You see, that's what the New Testament actually talks about when it talks about our wardrobe. It talks about what do we put on. And and I want you to listen to how Paul describes this in two different places, one, one in Romans and one in Galatians. Paul says this in Romans 13, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Paul says it this way in Galatians 3. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now, here, here's the thing. Paul is saying to us in, in that place, in terms of the translations, he's talking to us about putting on Christ, that we have been clothed in Christ. Now think about this. Sometimes your clothes have an effect on your perception of your identity. For instance, maybe it's a Saturday, and uh, depending on what I have going on, there are occasions where on a Saturday morning, I might be hanging around my house kicking it, laying back. I got on some baggy shorts. I've got on a t-shirt. I've got on a baseball cap. I probably haven't brushed my teeth yet. Sitting around, kicking back. That's how I'm dressed. I'm in kickback mode. But maybe in a little while, I have a responsibility to do a wedding, let's say. By the time I get out of the shower and I begin putting on that suit, I am transforming in that moment into pastor man. (laughs) Because I am am putting on that suit. I'm no longer in baggy shorts and a ball cap and a t-shirt laying around. Now I'm fully suited up and I have somehow transformed. I can actually see my identity in the mirror transforming before me as I am putting my tie on and turning into pastor man who's going to be pastor man for the wedding people. So you can see how sometimes, even though that's a silly illustration, Sometimes, even when we look at that kind of idea, we see that what we have on helps to shape the identity that we are walking in, right? So what Paul is saying to us is he's saying what we should be doing every day is making sure that we are waking up and recognizing that we are clothed in Christ Jesus, and that we put on Christ, we clothe ourselves in the reality of who he is. It's actually, it's even another way of talking about what it means to walk filled with the spirit. That to be clothed in Christ is another kind of way to say being filled with his spirit. Because when we do that, we are walking in a fundamental identity in who our true identity is, as opposed to maybe something else that we are putting on. And this is important because how we actually embrace our identity begins to shape us into that very thing. Uh, I I told you maybe about this a number of years ago, but there's this little short story that was written in the late 1800s, almost 1900. It was called The Happy Hypocrite, and it was written by a guy named Max Beerbaum. And you've probably never seen it, heard of it. I had never, until a few years ago, doing research for a message. And it's, it was an old book, you know, forever ago, and it's a real short story. And so here, here's the deal. The, the, the main guy in the story is named Lord George Hell. Whoa, well, hello. Thank you for that. Lord George Hell, that's his name. And it's his name for a good reason. This dude is a party machine. He is a carouser. He's a drunk. He's a, uh, he's a deceiver. He undercuts people in business dealings. He does all of that kind of stuff. And he's got a lady friend who's, whose name is Lagamboji. 
I don't know, I didn't write it. I would just called her Nikki, um, <laughs> right? La Gamboji is her name. And she is also a little bit, uh, maybe loose in the moral department. And so Lord George Hell and La Gamboji make a really nice little couple, straight from the pits, right? One day they are watching um, this show and there's a dancer in the show and her name is Jenny Mir, M-E-R-E. And Jenny Mir is just a sight to behold and Lord George Hell is like, wow, I've never seen someone so beautiful. She's lovely, she radiates. Wow, she's incredible. So he tries to get to know her to the chagrin of La Gamboji, of course, and he tries to get to know her and um, ends up asking her to marry him. And she says, absolutely not. She said, I will only marry a man who has the face of a saint. He clearly did not. His name was Lord George Hell. So, miffed by that, what Lord George Hell does in this story is he he goes into town and kind of on the down low, he speaks to a man who is a mask maker. And the man makes an incredible mask. He says, whatever you do, I need a mask that is the face of a saint. And he makes him a mask that is absolutely brilliantly done, that is in the face of a saint. And Lord George Hell puts on that mask and changes his name to George Heaven. <laughs> Short story, I didn't write it. George Heaven then begins to pursue Jenny. She doesn't quite know who he is. He runs into her kind of across a stream or whatever. And he sees her. And the, again, it's a short story. They don't really give you all the, back, the background of it. He, he ends up asking her to marry him. And Jenny says, she'll marry him. And she does. There on the marriage certificate, he's George Heaven. George Heaven is so thrilled by Jenny's willingness to take him on as her husband, he starts giving away all of his money to charitable causes. He doesn't undercut anyone in business dealings anymore. He moves out into the country and lives a simple life having given away his stuff. He treats her with great respect. He honors the people that are around him. It is absolutely staggering. And she is blown away by this husband that she's got and she's thrilled. She doesn't know that it was who he used to be. But there, eventually, La Gamboji comes back into the picture and finds him living out in the middle of the country. And she comes to the door and knocks on the door. Hello. And then she begins to destroy everything by telling Jenny, this is really Lord George Hell and you don't know what's going on and this is a terrible thing and blah, blah, blah. And then there's a fracas. I like that word. There's a fracas. There's a scuffle and things happen and whatever. And his mask finally gets ripped off only to discover that his face had morphed into the contours of the mask. And Jenny says, I knew it. I knew it. It's who I thought you were. And it ends with La Gamboji leaving, Jenny and George Heaven kissing, <laughs> and the mask melting in the sun. What a story, huh? Do you know what's interesting about that story? is that George took on an identity and the identity shaped him. Now, you and I need to understand that the identities that we embrace have a tendency to shape us into them. And if you are going to continue to call yourself simply a sinner, hey, listen, I'm no sinner, I'm, listen, Jerry, I'm just a sinner. You, listen, if you have been transformed by the gospel, you are not just a sinner. Even if you want to try and make it a really good sounding statement like, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, you're not. You were a sinner who was saved by grace, but you're not just a sinner who is saved by grace right now. You are a saint. That's what the Father says. And you're, I know sometimes it's hard for us to grapple with, but I want you to understand why this matters to your identity. The reason that it matters to your identity is because 
When you view yourself as a saint, you actually begin to act like one because daily you are putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. You are walking full of his spirit. Now, by the way, in becoming a saint, that doesn't mean that you walk around with your chest poked out going name schools after me. That is not at all what it means. Because to be filled with his spirit means that we will be clothed in humility. That's how a saint operates. Instead of being a sinner who feigns humility by just telling everybody how sinful they are. I'm all in some people's business right now. (laughs) But I also used the word fracas earlier, so I think that kind of evens out. Let me tell you why this is important as well. Because if you view yourself as a saint, if you view yourself as a sinner, let's say, I'm just a sinner, all right? And by the way, if you've never met Jesus Christ, there is a description in the scripture for you, sinner. That is who you are. If you've never come to a place where you've turned from sin and been transformed by Jesus, here's who you are according to the scripture, a sinner. This is what the Bible teaches, a sinner. You are apart from God. You have no hope in the world. You have no hope of eternal life. You're gonna be your own God and you're gonna fail at it. There is one. There's one name under heaven by which people must be saved and that is the name of Jesus. All those who are in him, saints. All those who reject him, sinners. That's what the scripture says. And we all were once sinners. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ, the scripture says. So if you view yourself, if if you are a child of God, you have been transformed by God's spirit, but you continue to view your identity as one of, I'm just a sinner. Let me tell you what that does. What that does is that every time you sin, you just chalk it up to something that is natural and inevitable because you just view yourself as a sinner. That's just what I do. I'm a sinner. It's just what I do. But if you view yourself as a saint, and you clothe yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ, when you sin, and by the way, saints do sometimes sin, but saints don't have to sin. So when we do sin as saints, do you know what that does to us? We actually, instead of thinking of that as normal and as natural, we understand it to be incredibly inconsistent with the recreated us that it is absolutely inconsistent with the recreated us. And as a result, we feel the depth of the pain of it even more significantly, which brings us to a place of repentance and doing works that give evidence of repentance. This is the difference in how we view ourselves. Sinners who view themselves as sin, I mean, saints who view themselves as sinners, when they sin, often don't get to a place of repentance and reconciliation because they just view themselves as this is natural and inevitable. But saints feel it more deeply because they realize how inconsistent sin is with the recreated us. So this is why it matters. This is why I'm saying our wardrobe can be a hindrance to our ability to walk as saints. But there's a second thing, and that's our story. You say, man, what are you talking about here? Well, Here's what I want you to understand. Your identity is bigger than your story. Don't miss this. Your identity is bigger than your story. Let me, I'm gonna illustrate in a couple of different ways. I've got a number of friends who um, have adopted internationally. Uh, numbers of people in our church have and other friends that I have have internationally. Every single one of those children comes with a story. And it's a real story. It's a factual story. Some of them were living in orphanages. It's a part of their story. Some of them were malnourished. Some of them were abused. This is all a part of their story. And when they're adopted, listen to this, their story doesn't change. The facts of the story are what they are but how they are known does change when they get adopted. The facts of the story are what they are. The story doesn't change, but how they are known does change. You know why? Because many of them got a new name. They got a new family. They got a new citizenship. 
And so now their identity is being shaped and it becomes bigger than their story. And everything doesn't have to be viewed only based upon the facts that are hard and broken and messed up. Though the story does shape identity, identity is bigger and more powerful than the story. In fact, let me illustrate this in a biblical sense, if I may, by using Abraham's story, just so you see what I'm talking about. If you remember, um, when God chose Abraham, he said to Abraham back in Genesis 12, I'm going to bless the world through you. I'm going to rescue the world through you. And, it's, you know, and Abraham was like, okay. He said, yeah, I'm going to give you and Sarah a son. And Sarah didn't have any kids. Abraham didn't have any kids. That's a problem. And the fact that Abraham was a million years old, as was Sarah. This was a problem. God says, I'm, I'm making a promise. I'm going to give you a, a child. Okay, listen to how that went down in that conversation in Genesis chapter 17. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? Okay, so here's the facts of the story. God says, here's what I'm gonna do. You two old timers, I'm gonna give you a child. Abraham goes, ah! <laughs> I'm 100. She's <laughs> That's the facts of the story. Is that how you want your story to be told for the rest of your life? Oh, that's Abraham, yeah. He laughed at God. So that's the facts of the story, and the, the story's facts don't change. But when Paul begins talking about Abraham in Romans chapter 4, Paul is speaking through the lens of Abraham's identity, not just the facts of the story. You see, because Paul had already said in the early portion of Romans that Abraham's faith or belief was credited to him as righteousness. That Abraham had a fundamental identity shift because now there is a righteousness attributed to him because of his faith because of his belief. And so listen to how Paul articulates through the lens of identity the same story in Romans chapter four, verse 18. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. You see, the story for Abraham, the facts of the story that don't change are he laughed at God, but... Because his identity had been altered as a man who believed and it was credit to him as righteousness, Paul actually addresses the story not by talking about that, but by talking about the man who continued to trust God in the midst of it. His identity grew stronger than his story. That's what needs to happen in our lives, that our identities need to grow stronger than our stories because some of you have allowed your story to become a prison cell. And so now what you do is you, you go back in your mind all the time and you say, you know what? I laughed at God and that's your story and you're sticking to it. Or I blew it with my kids or I got fired from that job a number of years ago for some unethical behavior. Or I gave in to that sexual temptation a number of years ago. 
and you are allowing your story to define you because now you view yourself as just a sinner. But I want you to think of Paul. Paul, the one who wrote 1 Corinthians and addressed all of these people that were walking through difficulties. By the way, he wasn't excusing their sin. He was rebuking it. But he was still communicating to them, understanding their identity, that they had been transformed but were making mistakes and needed correction. And he said, you are set apart from sin, set apart to God, and you are saints. It's who you are and what you've been called to be. So live into who you are. Be who you are. That's what he's saying to them. But think of his life. Paul himself gave some self-revelatory comments about himself in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Listen to what he says beginning in verse 15. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now, some of you are going, see, there it is. There's my justification for just calling myself a sinner. Paul called himself a sinner. He said, he came, Jesus came to save the sinners of whom I am the worst. See, there it is. He said, I am the worst. Well, number one, you have to understand how Jewish people talk. Jewish people sometimes, particularly Paul, even when he's writing, sometimes speaks in the present tense about a past activity. And if we read the bigger context, we would see that plain and simple. In fact, back up to verse 13 of 1 Timothy chapter 1, listen to what Paul says. Even though I once was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. You see what he's talking about? He's talking about who he was. He's talking about who he was. You know, this is the guy who persecuted the church. This is the guy who put people to death. This is the guy who said yes to the people, to killing the people who he is now preaching the gospel of to make other people like those people. This is that guy. He says, that's who I was. But do you know who I am now? He categorizes himself with the people that he addresses when he includes himself together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he says this. I, who was a sinner, and by the way, the worst of them, I am sanctified, set apart from sin, set apart to God. I am a saint. Now, the voices of your past, if you have been transformed by Jesus, the voices of some of the things that have happened in your past story will shout you down almost every day of your life. They will shout you down. And they are saying this to you. You are a sinner. But your father says, you are a saint. So put on Christ and let his identity shape you. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? Before we're get up and are dismissed or moving around, I would ask very simply that if you're here and you have never come to faith in Jesus Christ, never entrusted your life to Jesus, you say, well, it seems kind of judgmental for you to say that I'm a sinner, Jerry. That's not judgmental at all. Every single one of us in this room either are identified as a sinner or were. Doesn't mean we don't all sin, we do. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the scripture says. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you want to have a fundamental identity shift away from being a sinner to being a saint who admittedly, a saint who sometimes sins, but a saint nonetheless, then you must turn from sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the sinless one who became sin for you and for me that we might become the righteousness of God. That is the only way you can enter into relationship with the Father 
and be, have a fundamental identity change. So if you're here and you've never before entrusted your life to Jesus and say, you know what, I, I need to give my life to Christ. I want to move from being a sinner in the eyes of God to being a saint because of what Jesus has done and my faith in him. If that's your desire, then maybe right where you are, you just say something like this in your heart. Father, I know that I have sinned and I have come short of the glory of God. And I know that I can't save myself. But I believe in what Jesus did. His sinless, perfect life given in exchange for mine. That he took my sin and he satisfied your justice. And he rose from the dead conquering sin and death in the grave. So I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my life to forgive me of my sin and to transform my identity. If you've done that just now with me in your heart, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed in this room in the East Worship Center, if you just did that with me and you prayed that and you meant it with all your heart and you said, you know what, this is, I've never really walked into that level of a faith decision before. But today I mean business. God's got my attention. You'd say, Jerry, I just prayed that with you. Meant it with all my heart. Would you just put your hand up in the air for just a moment? I won't embarrass you. I'm not gonna call on you or anything like that. Just put it up high, wherever you are, all over the room. Put it up high for a moment. Leave it there for a second. I'm just kind of looking around. Wow. That's a bunch of us, man. That's a bunch of us. You can put your hands down. Thanks very much for doing that. Could I ask you to do something? When we dismiss in just a moment, I'm gonna ask those of you who had the, the courage to raise your hand to make one other step. And really, it's, it doesn't take that much courage if I'm being honest. We're all on your team. We're for you. It's not like you're in the middle of a country where they're, you know, they're gonna persecute you for trusting Jesus. We're for you here. But what I want you to do, if you just raised your hand a moment ago, when we dismiss in a moment, there's gonna be some pastors and some other friends that are gonna be in the fireside room. We won't keep you very long. Would you come by there and just say to them, I, I prayed with Jerry to receive Jesus? Because they wanna give you something to take home. They wanna pray for you. And they want to send you out of here with something that you can take home with you. What it, what it really means to begin following Jesus. If you don't have a Bible, we'll give you one. Okay? That's all we want to do. It's not creepy or weird or scary. I'm just asking you to do it. And I'm leaving it up to you. My job isn't to manipulate you. My job isn't to twist your arm. If you're serious with Jesus, you don't need my coaxing. So I'm just going to ask you to come by when we dismiss in just a moment. And let us help you on your journey of faith, pray with you, send you home with something that'll be a benefit to you as you walk with Jesus. Father, thank you for those who have responded, the many in this room and maybe those that I wasn't able to see in the East Worship Center, maybe even those that are watching online. And I pray you would give God um, the strength for them to follow through, to be able to talk to someone, to solidify the reality and the truth and the authenticity of that decision and then our ability to support them by giving them some things to help them. And, and Father, I pray for all of us that we would understand if we have been transformed by you and we have been born from above, that we are saints. That is the way that you view us. Not based upon our good things, but based upon what Christ has done on our behalf. But that when we clothe ourselves daily in Christ, we, our identity begins to shape us more and more because we begin living into our true selves. Not something that we can cosmetically or esoterically change, but what changes on the inside of us. The real us that is only found in relationship to God through Jesus by the power of the Spirit. So help us to walk in that truth. I ask now in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you folks, you're dismissed.